The struggle for control of cricket was now underway between the professionals and the cricket establishment at Lords. To win this war, the MCC turned to the maverick genius who was to become the first star of English cricket, W.G. Grace. Grace came from a middle-class family of doctors, but the MCC persuaded him to use his extraordinary talents to promote their amateur game and see off the professionals. Grace was really in a class of his own. Had he joined with the professionals in the sort of late 1860s, the game would have changed completely. We wouldn't have had the, the game that we've had for the last hundred years or so because he was the great draw and the crowds and the money would have followed him wherever he went. Grace revolutionized cricket. He invented a huge repertoire of strokes and was one of the first English cricketers to play off the back foot as well as the front. He introduced what could be called modern defensive play uh, until he came along uh, basically the batsman did not use his pads it was not considered proper they were merely for defending his legs you used your bat to hit the ball and so uh, for decades batsmen would drive airily at the ball and it would come between bat and pad and bowl them so by playing the bat and pad together W.G. Grace um, initiated modern defensive play. Despite his contribution to the art of defense, Grace was an extrovert on and off the pitch, a celebrity. One writer called him part of a national baggage, and I think that, 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 that gets it rather nicely. He was, you know, he was just part of the national scene. And he was just around for so, you know, for so long. I mean, he was playing first-class cricket in his 50s. As an amateur, Grace was forbidden from making money from cricket. But to keep him on side, the cricketing establishment turned a blind eye to him making a fortune out of expenses. Perhaps the best measure of the greatness of W.G. Grace as a cricketer can be taken from the traditional gentlemen versus players fixtures played between amateur gentlemen and professional players. The gentlemen v players game was the, the number one game of the English season. Uh, certainly in the years before Test Cricket and even when Test Cricket started I think as far as status went the gentlemen v players was the, the number one game uh, in a sense, it basically involved the, the gentlemen being the amateurs against the players who were the professionals and uh, so they, this represented the absolute cream of, uh, of English cricket and in the years before Grace came on the, the players held the upper hand where Grace as a gentleman then came in and just his record in Gentlemen v players cricket is quite extraordinary. In the 19th century, really, they were the bedrock of, of English cricket, and uh, they were bigger than test matches. They only appeared in 1877, right at the end of the end of the century. Um, and Grace really made them their, made them his own for 20 years. He was he was over 50 when he played his last one in 1899, and uh, he he just bossed them like uh, no one has ever bossed uh, a particular form of fixture before. And the irony is that he was an amateur. He, he played for the gentlemen against the players, when in actual fact, uh, and to call W.G. Grace a gentleman is, is an absolute travesty. Despite his amateur status, Grace profited considerably from cricket. He was well paid, even when he represented the amateur gentlemen against the players. He always captained the gentlemen against the players, but uh, he was about as much an amateur as any of our present-day professionals are, because he had two uh, enormous testimonials years, each of which then, back in the 1880s, 1870s, amounted to over £10,000. Well, that's what, what are 20,000 pounds add up to today? Three million, four million? So he was a pretty shrewd old doctor, and I don't think he did much doctoring, but what a player. I think he was as near as makes no difference a professional cricketer, really, for the, for, for the time when he was playing the game. I mean, he certainly charged a very large fee to go as captain to Australia, um, and Lord Sheffield, I think, coughed up most of that. Uh, but he, yeah, so he knew his worth, certainly, and I should think he made at least as much out of his cricket as he did uh, out of his uh, surgery. 
in, in a sense, a long way away ahead of his time, in the sense that he realised that, you know, he was the number one figure. He, he was entitled to be well paid for that. And uh, he also, I think, realised that he had, he was an entertainer. And, he, and he, he, one of his obligations was to entertain the people who came to see him play. What he was good at, as an amateur, he was absolutely brilliant. Um, he was marvellously good at making huge dollops of money for himself. I mean, <laughs> W.G. Grace, the amateur cricketer. Anything he could get, get out of the game, he would. I mean, eye-wateringly huge sums. Uh, 1,500 pounds plus first-class accommodation for himself and his wife, plus, and this is the real killer on the expenses, all he could drink. That was for his first tour of Australia in the 1870s. By the 1890s, he was charging 3,000 pounds. I mean, you could buy a whole row of houses for, for 3,000 pounds in the 1890s. This practice, known as shamateurism, became part and parcel of the English game. Grace's shamateurism was a, a matter of controversy throughout his career, and there were moments when the professionals got really angry about it and protested about it. Grace went blithely on, ignoring everything, and, and indeed stoutly denying that he was anything but an amateur. But the fact is that it was the most blatant um, example of shamateurism in an age riven by hypocrisy. Grace, the gentleman, also behaved on numerous occasions in ways that were really not cricket. In 1882, in one of their first testy confrontations with Australia, the game was in the balance and England were fielding. There was a new batsman, a young batsman um, called Sammy Jones, who'd come to the crease. Um, the Australians stole a run and then when the ball came back from the outfield, it ended up in Grace's hands. Now, Sammy Jones left his ground and patted down a divot on, on the wicket, and Grace promptly ran him out. And as a result of that, um, Spofforth, the great Australian fast bowler, who's known as the Demon, completely lost his rag and worked himself up into a complete temper, um, and he said, this will cost you the match. Now, England only had 85 to win, and then there was a terrible collapse, and Spofford tore through the England middle order and tail and won this most improbable victory, inspired by Grace's lack of sportsmanship. So I always like to think that WG was actually responsible for the whole Ashes thing coming into being. So shocking was the defeat that a mock obituary to English cricket was published, and the subsequent contests against Australia became known as the Ashes. There's the a famous story, possibly apocryphal, but it, it sums him up perfectly. The, the occasion when he was bowled by some young, uh, young thruster and he picked up the bales, put them back on, said, the, the, the people here have come to see me bat, not you bowl, sir, and carried on batting. Uh, it was true. People paid good money to flock to see the doctor play cricket and uh, the doctor took, uh, took home a fair amount of money for, for a supposed amateur. Grace retired from Test cricket in 1899 and from First Class cricket in 1908. His final recorded game at any level came a week after his 66th birthday, when he made 69 not out. Some of the figures, uh, which are astonishing, I mean, he was still playing for England. He was still opening for England at 50 years of age. He scored 166 for London counties the day after his 56th birthday. So he was amassing all these amazing number of runs. William Grace died of a heart attack in 1915 during the Great War. It was a very sad and poignant moment, not just for cricket, but for England. Of course, such a well-known cricketer dying at a time he did midway through the Great War when so many young men were being killed in the fields of Flanders. It was a, a great tragedy and was mourned widely across the country. He was the subject of countless cricketing stories, some exaggerated over the years, many of them true. What is impossible to dispute is Dr. W.G. Grace's contribution to the game of cricket. I suppose you could say he was the father of the sport, 
and helped it grow, started to make it grow. Um, and because he was such a larger than life character, WG would, was, was always going to be. Um, this is how English cricket started. He was the man that, that pushed it on and he was the man that sort of gave it the lifeblood, if you like. Of all the champion cricketers honoured in this series, Grace is the most difficult to rate. His greatest years came before Test cricket began. Had he played today, he would have been as famous as Shane Warne, as tough and successful as Steve Waugh. He would have been a box office sensation. But it is primarily for his massive contribution to the game in its formative years that Dr. W.G. Grace has an honoured place amongst ESPN's Legends of Cricket.